All right, so we're going to, uh, it is Pentecost today, and uh, the Feast of Pentecost. So it's, it's a thing that occurs each year. So what I'm going to do is to explain things for people who, I know there are different levels of understanding, so I'm, I'm going to recap some things to try to bring, draw people towards uh, a bit of a, lev a more level playing field. And also to open up this, that if you don't quite understand what I'm saying, then that's fine, it's not a problem. And you need to speak after the sermon and then um, we will give uh, access, resources, DVDs to that really bring you into this very important, very, very important issue of the feasts. The feasts of Israel, which are God's uh, feasts, by the way, sorry. So we're gonna look at who planned the feast, uh, the date, when, why, what has it got to do with the church and me today? We're gonna look at a few things like that. <coughs> So we need to start at a couple of things that some people might not realize. Firstly, a Jewish day, um, the day defined by God, not the Jews, um, it starts from sundown until sundown. And Genesis 1.5 is the reason why. And it says that God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening. So sunset, from sundown there was evening and there was morning, sun up one day and that's the definition of a day and that's the definition that's carried forward in scripture of a day right so it's from sundown to sundown <clears throat> now god's calendars are they're lunar and they're also um solar uh calendar so you know the muslims are all m based on the moon for example uh here in the west it's all based on the sun. Um, but in God's calendar, in the scriptures, he's using at times both the sun and the moon, which he put as signs in the heavens for us to be able to do this um, as the means of communicating. Now, one of the reasons for this, using the sun and the moon, one of the reasons was that the feasts, we're going to look at one of them, but these feasts, are designed by God to operate in a particular community of people that live in an agricultural society. And he's going to use not just his words, not just patterns that people are doing, but he's going to use the actual agricultural cycles to have the rhythm of the story of redemption that's sitting under the feast. It's a, it's a most amazing thing. And I've got to stop going down rabbit holes, but it's a, a very, very amazing thing that he's using uh, these patterns and the reality of agriculture so by using the sun and the moon what he does is he prevents uh, a misalignment one year to another of uh, you know when will the barley season come in you know when will the wheat come in when should the fruit be gathered he's keeping his calendar dates in line with the Israeli cycle interestingly enough when you see God set the dates the Jews themselves are not even in Israel. He's setting them with the calendar and the agriculture of Israel, but they're actually in Egypt. They're in Egypt and they've got to come out. And he's, given them the, he's given them the dates and the plans in Egypt <laughs> to go to Israel. <laughs> Yee. Praise your name, Lord. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> so... Uh, by the way, yeah, so uh, the reason I asked you to look at your bulletin was I gave you the calendar as a bit of a structure I've, I've also noticed by looking at different scholars that some disagree a little bit on the descriptions is let's just get the big picture let's not worry about nitty gritty bits at the moment so I've put a box well let's start from the left the column on the left is the Gregorian that is our calendar to give us a feel when these things happen in in our uh, language and our calendar then you've got the Jewish calendar and you've got the name of different months which you may not have heard of before and that's not important but it's just showing you what they are if you knew them you can see at the first item the first uh, row it's Nissan uh, which used to be called Abib and what is it in the agricultural cycle you've got the latter rains barley harvest and the flax harvest and then what are the special days 
at that period of time in the agricultural cycle. And the key here is the first seven items on the column on the right. They are what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about with the seven feasts. And you can see there Nissan, 14, Passover, and then you see unleavened bread, then you see first fruits, then you see per Pentecost, item four, then you see trumpets, item five, Day of Atonement and Tabernacles. Each of these have got an actual Hebrew, not just one Hebrew name, but there are descriptive names. Very, again, an amazing study to see the facets of the different feasts that where they, they have been given names in Hebrew, which when you open up the name and you give it consideration, you begin to realize that these facets are all coming back to Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. These poor <laughs> Jews back in, back in the day of Jesus' time, they're doing all this and they, they don't know it's Jesus. You know, that's the irony, the sad, sad irony of uh, most of the Jews at the time mainly due, of course, to their religious leaders uh, who were more concerned with the traditions of men and so on. And, but uh, nevertheless. So the last thing, probably just general point, is remember that the number seven, I'm just saying this dogmatically, but you can study it and I'll give you materials if you don't have got any concern about what I'm saying. The number seven, when used spiritually in the Bible, seven occurs many, many times, hundreds of times. When it is used with a spiritual meaning, it can be literal. So you're reading a seven of something and it literally is seven things, like seven churches in Revelation. They were seven churches. But the seven, when you encounter this seven and, and God is intending, you keep alert because the seven is a number of uh, completeness, uh, you could say, or a completion, either about something or someone and this is used over and over again to communicate to us so for example with the seven churches that you read about in revelation um, uh, chapters uh, two and three right two and three you then realize completion so is it possible that those seven churches are not just real churches do not just re have real problems but perhaps god is also telling me because it's seven of them um, that God is telling me this is defining something about what's happening in the completion of the entire church. And where would the church end up? We, uh, you know, in, in the end times, where would be the last characteristic of the church? You would go and look at the church of Laodicea because it's the seventh church. And then you begin to realize when you get into this, it's a church with the opinions of men and there's sort of characteristics which you begin recognizing today. And you begin to see that uh, these things... Um, have a relevance beyond purely the text. Okay, do you understand? And this applies with the feasts as well. You're going to see this. Now, another thing that um, many people don't realize the significance of this, to me it's like astounding, is that God, Israel had a calendar three and a half thousand years ago. And uh, today we call it a civil calendar. They had a calendar, they had months, everybody was using it. And before they go to Egypt, God says to Moses in Exodus 12, 2, we needn't go there because I need to move through these things quickly. But again, I'll send out the notes. But if you want to jot down some of the verses, do. This is Exodus 12, 2. You would find that God tells Moses to do the most ridiculous thing. They've got a calendar. It's got 12 months. It all works. Why change it? No, this is God. He's planned this before the world began. So he picks up the last six months and tells Moses to make them the first six months on a new calendar. So they already had a calendar, and now he's telling them, just move those there, giving them essentially a second calendar. And of course, this is intended to draw our attention. This is intended to smack us around the face and say, I'm going to be doing something big here. And uh, I'm moving, so watch what I'm doing. And uh, so about three and a half thousand years ago, Moses did what he was told, and they ended, ended up with what they would call a religious calendar. Personally, I call it a born-again calendar. A born-again calendar in the sense of 
Israel was coming out as a nation. God is working with them. They're, they're coming through uh, aspects of a process as a nation. And uh, he's giving them, essentially, within this new calendar, a scheme of how his total redemption will work through world history for the believer. What Christ is going to do, how he's going to do it, when he's going to do it, the sequence of the major events. Okay. Uh, so in this calendar, we also see in Leviticus 23, and I do, if you've got a Bible, I would like you to go to Leviticus 23. We see in this chapter the seven events. Seven, completion. Seven what? Seven feasts. Okay, so again, just like the seven churches maybe, and they are, telling us something about world history with churches, seven feasts are telling us something about world history again, something about world history. So he gives them like events. He, he starts giving them instructions on remember this day every year, but don't just remember it. You've got to do things. You've got to worship me. You've got to obey certain uh, liturgical commands. You've got to do certain priestly things. You've got to do certain sacrifices. And you must do them. And you must do them exactly how I tell you to do them. Seven feasts. A bit like if you could imagine. So what he's doing is he's setting up like a wedding where the bride and the groom and the best man and the people they go and the pastor says at the wedding we're actually at the real wedding we're going to do this and that but we need to practice so we're going to practice putting the ring on we're going to practice what you say we're going to see who comes who comes first and second you mustn't go too fast uh, you people will do that then you will stop and he orchestrates the, the wedding and it, in a well-organized uh, wedding, this would be done as a routine before you do the wedding. That's what these feasts are. These feasts are an orchestration of an actual event that will come relating to Jesus, but it hasn't come. But I want you to do the pattern so that when you see these coming, you know I knew the end from the beginning, and it's all about Jesus, your Messiah. And uh, so this is the thing, this is the concept. So when he gave the calendar days, it's not just, you know, I'd, I'd really like to, you to think about me and do a few sacrifices every now and then, every year to remember me. Although, of course, as they would go to these feasts, they would also be worshipping and the, these devout Jews, glorifying God and doing everything meticulously the way God is asking and uh, so it was a very, very important and very uh, serious process for the Jews with the priesthood, the Levitical priests, everybody being geared. All the Israel's people, uh, the devout people coming together, those who could be there, because remember, many Jews were dispersed and they couldn't necessarily get to the feast. So three times a year, the Jews would gather to execute these seven dates. This is what they would do. And uh, they would do it devoutly. They would try to do it exactly as they understood it should be done uh, year after year. From when? From when God gave Moses the command in Leviticus 23. They still, as they're going out of Egypt, he's now given them this, this routine. It's, and it comes in pieces through the Bible to further explain the wedding process. A bit more is given and so on to the Jews and then it is recorded in the scriptures so they are essentially then if you put it another way these seven feasts are dress rehearsals they're dress rehearsals of things that Jesus will do in real history they're not just theoretical constructs that uh, have got artistic merit and this is why we do it and God needs a lot of blood from animals you know to please him and so on no everything is patterning Something we can learn about his relationship with, through Christ, in what respect? In the respect of the total earthly, it's not the big story of Adam and Eve right through to the new, her, new earth and the new heavens. It's, more, it's constructed into a part of the story, all to do with Jesus. What is the glue to these seven feasts? They describe what Jesus is going to be doing through world history to execute 
a plan which will start with his death at the Passover and finish with him being the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords on earth again at his second coming with a kingdom for a thousand years. And everything, every major thing he is doing to execute for us this salvation, not just the salvation to, okay, I was going to hell and now I'm not going to hell, but to empower us through the Holy Spirit at Pentecost to give us the empowerment as a church body of Jew and Gentile. Remember, the church is primarily Jew and we're the Gentile add-on. And we may outnumber the Jews, but it's Jew and Gentile. Let's never get things wrong here. Okay. <laughs> so we're in this Jew and Gentile bond. And we are part of the church. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Because but today, by the way, it, putting it in another way, today is the birthday of the church. Pentecost. It's the birthday. So God gave this calendar. Understand as well, the reason you don't know much about this is what? <laughs> well, there's a guy in the Bible called Satan. Satan. Now, what does Satan want to do? Well, the last thing he wants you to know is the dates, the meaning, the significance, and the glory of what God is doing in history. So he'd rather that you uh, took a, a, a period of time which is not on the calendar properly, call it Christmas, have a guy called Santa Claus, have him riding through the air and dropping presents to every kid all over the earth, get yourself drunk, overeat, give each other loads of presents, and be totally oblivious of the real calendar and the real events. Do you understand what I'm saying? Look, we've got to be categoric here. I mean, I'm, I talk bluntly and it's got to be blunt. The calendar items we use are satanic. People mean well, and I would always be gentle. I'm talking to friends. I'm not going to walk over to a, a believer who's sincere and, and they don't understand and, and talk to them as bluntly as I am to you. But they are totally satanic because they're not of God. The calendar is this calendar we're talking about today. The seven feasts. That's the calendar events we should be monitoring. And what is the timing? Not the timing that the Catholic Church says or somebody else is saying. The timing that God gave. They're his appointments, his calendar, his timings. Not Satan's. Not the world's. Not Zoomer's. I mean, why do we see Satan again getting us, what do we have? Heritage Day, Farmer's Day. Gay's day, I don't know, painter's day. We've got so many days, I mean, we're losing track. of That's deliberate again from Satan. Because by charging day after day into the calendar of the world, it just minimizes and minimizes even the ones that are not strictly the day, but at least are, are attempting to do something to do with God, they're getting hidden away, hidden away. Do you understand what's going on? There's a war going on. And so understand, I'm talking to you of God's calendar, not Israel's calendar. It's a calendar given to Israel, because most of the church, they say, ah, oh, this is Israel's calendar. You don't need to listen to any of this nonsense. These people don't read their Bible. This is God's calendar. It says in Leviticus 23, the Lord spoke again to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, the Lord's appointed times which you shall proclaim as holy convocations, my appointed times are these, and so on. You could get other verses. But this is about God's feast, not Israel's feast. Israel are the people who conveyed these feasts down to us very faithfully, actually. No matter how much they uh, apostatized at times, at the end of the day, through the prophets and the scribes and others, we got this text that told us the message. We got the message through the Jews. We got salvation through the Jews. So we're not holding them up. They're no better than us in a genetic sense or any other sense. <laughs> but God gave them the problem. <laughs> he could have given it to Swazi people or whatever. He gave it to the Jews. An insignificant group of people. And uh, so that's how he worked. And we thank God for his plan. And we thank God for for the Jews with all their like Anthony Sire. <laughs> There's loads of things you can point at, but hey boy, be careful of pointing.
<laughs> rather let the finger come back here first before you start pointing at them and uh, so yes and much of the church doesn't understand this in fact it completely denies any relevance to Israel and the Jews so these appointed times for six days work may be done and on the seventh day verse 3 is a Sabbath of complete rest Sabbath and uh, notice that the Sabbath is a feast, a feast but it's not the annual feast therefore that isn't part of the seven these are the appointed times of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim and uh, so on we read and in verse 5 we see the word of one of the feasts, Passover. Then in verse 6 we see another feast that happens in the same month, unleavened bread. Then we go down to verse 9 and we see there's a speaking of a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest. First fruits is a feast. And then you carry on down and uh, you see in verse 15 you will count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering there shall be seven complete Sabbaths in other words 49 days and then you shall count 50 days so you add one day to the day after the seventh Sabbath so you count seven Sabbaths from when from the previous feast which was the feast of first fruits and uh, you shall bring in from your dwelling places two loaves of bread for a wave offering etc so you can see and if you were to read this chapter you will see every one of the seven feasts right they're there the plan is there their plan is told it doesn't elucidate here everything they had to do and the exact way they did certain rituals and whatever um, it, it, the revelation given in the word doesn't try to describe everything but uh, there are means that we can uh, use to find out the significant things that are inside these different feasts okay so you've got the idea so in Jesus time the males were required to go to the temple three times a year and imagine again a guy maybe he's going to take his family and he's going to traipse from who? maybe a hundred miles away <laughs> these guys imagine this again that you get out of a helicopter and you're watching this and at the time of Passover you are you know if you could have a helicopter you're seeing these people coming down the roads coming down the road caravans because they would go together for safety and they're coming and there's already all the others in Jerusalem already that are living nearby and this mass of people this mass of people are coming in Jesus time because then the temple was there and they're coming to the temple as they've been asked to do three times a year if they could others that couldn't get there they would be making other plans to try and honor God and respect what was happening on the calendar without being there out of interest so they would be doing what rehearsing the feasts even though the difference is at the wedding everybody knows it's a wedding and they know why they're doing it the difference is with the Jews they weren't quite sure what they were actually doing and they they weren't recognizing this is all about our Messiah and this is telling us what's gonna they weren't recognizing that you see so they were rehearsing something but because they were told to God said do it Moses told them gave them the law so they are doing it for one and a half thousand years on and off because there were different things that interjected for one and a half thousand years up to Christ they are doing the rehearsing of something that hasn't happened and in fact it's very likely they weren't really expecting stuff to be happening um, but anyway it's another story so these feasts are giving the patterns about Jesus and seven earthly acts now I mentioned uh, Oh, well let's just let's just uh, make a couple of other points so you've got the seven acts and the, the point about these acts are that when we examine history we begin to see that not only are they seven acts that describe it they are in sequence historically so they're going to happen what number one is going to happen before number two then number two is going to follow one before three they are following exactly in the order given to Moses the historical events that actually are the reality of every one of the feasts is happening exactly in the sequence being given it's an amazing thing and uh, not just roughly in the month the day the day to the day so when Jesus died upon a cross as the Lamb of God the Passover Lamb 
they were killing the lamb on the day and the time. The high priest was doing the final lamb. These things are happening in synchronization. When Jesus rose from the dead as our first fruits, the priest is out going through a ritual and he's waving the first fruits before God, thanking him, thanking him, not realizing that Jesus is the first fruits. He's just risen from the dead. So, on the one hand, this poor chap, with all sincerity, is <laughs> waving this and thanking God while he's been planning earlier to kill Jesus, who is the first fruits. You see the, the, the terrible irony. Not all the Jews, some Jews understood, but not, unfortunately, many of them didn't. But they understood later, many, many, many of them, when he rose from the dead and, and when they saw Pentecost. Because the Jews knew. Step one, rise from the dead. How the heck did he do that? It's got to be God. And then they saw Pentecost and they were now putting two and two together. The Spirit, the power of the Spirit is coming and he's showing us that Jesus is the one. Jesus is the Messiah. And they've got power, and so on. We're going to see that. Spiritual power. Peter and others go from just being a fisherman to a phenomenal preacher, pastor, and so on and so forth, just overnight. So when I said they were in sequence, to be specific for those of you, I don't want to dwell on this, but to just give you a starter that you can just bear in mind, it would start with Passover, his death. Um, by the way, if you were attentive in your Bible, you would see that four days, he came to Jerusalem four days before his death. If you were attentive to dates, you would see that. You say, well, so what? And then you would see, well, what are they doing? In, what are the Jews doing with their feast? Well, they, they've taken the animals and they secure them and they are examining them for that period when they're examining Christ in Jerusalem and trying to trick him. They are doing it with their lambs. The lambs that they will eventually put onto the Passover death. And you see the Sadducees, you see the Pharisees and you see people trying to trick Jesus. And you see us in scripture, you can see they're testing him and then eventually they give up. And you read and they walked away and they stop. And so on and so forth, right? So Passover, unleavened bread. Jesus gets buried in the tomb. And he is our bread. He's the bread of life. First fruits, he resurrects from the dead on the timing of first fruits, the empty tomb and so on. Pentecost, 50 days exactly after first fruits, exactly as the feast dates, the Holy Spirit inaugurates the, the church. Jesus had prophesied this. He'd instructed the apostles to do this. He told them to go into the upper room and pray. They, they still don't catch what exactly is going to happen. And there they are praying. And then, vroom, the Holy Spirit comes on the, <laughs> on the 50th day. And uh, we see the start of the new covenant church age. Trumpets, Jesus, there's some dispute about this, but I, my, I favor the idea that trumpets is a pattern of Jesus returning for his bride church bride day of atonement the books are closed jesus is going to return at his second coming and anybody who is not saved no matter what they see about jesus and no matter how much they try to change their mind uh, they are doomed those who are not saved when he comes back on judgment day the books will be closed just as the pattern of the feast and uh, judgment is complete who's saved and who's not saved at that time on earth Tabernacles is, when we study that, it is the joy and the fulfillment of the plan. And the kingdom, there's peace and so on that we can read about in the books of Isaiah and other prophets of this wonderful time when there will be a kingdom and Jesus is ruling with a rod of iron. There's no more Islamic nonsense or any other nonsense. And uh, there's going to be close to an idyllic scenario that is a pattern again of Adam in the beginning where God is walking the earth except it's not in a tiny garden and it's not with two people it's across the entire earth with all believers at that time that are still living on the earth after they've been through some troubles on the earth 
So the, f the next thing I just want to tell you, the big thing about that, is the first four feasts have already been completed in what? In his first coming. So when people tell us, don't worry about the future, don't worry about end times, don't worry about prophecy, they are in loony tunes because they don't realize, do they think that God puts seven feasts up and he's going to do four and then pack up and go and call it quits? There's three feasts coming. And they're coming in the sequence of those feasts. We need to understand what those feasts are because they will either confirm or undermine your view of end times. If your view of end times isn't in line with these feasts, you've got the wrong view. You need to rethink. When people say that uh, God's finished with Israel and whatever, you, you've got no clue. You need to be looking from God's perspective. Now, God's got another view. There's a second coming coming, <laughs> a second coming coming, and the trumpets, the Day of Atonement and Tabernacles are going to come, and they're going to do things on the world scale, on a world-level scale, that complete the redemptive acts of Christ on earth, of major events, major singular events. All of these events, you will notice another thing, they don't happen in Taiwan, Bombay, England, they all happen in and around Jerusalem. And they're all expedited. Even the sending of the Holy Spirit is expedited by Jesus. All of these seven feasts are being expedited by the Son of God, the living Son of God. And uh, so there's, these feasts are coming. They're coming, brother. If you don't know about it, we've got literature and you can begin to look into this. So the first four feasts are completed in world history on the dates of the feasts, by the way. <laughs> and uh, the last three will complete at his second coming. That is what I would suggest to you is the correct way of looking at it. Now, okay, so let's get to a little bit of, a small bit of detail about Pentecost itself, because it is Pentecost today. So the timings of it are in Leviticus 23. You can go home and you can read that and you can see the timings and you can get references to other passages that explore and open up these things further if you wish. It happened 50 days after Sabbath, as we've already mentioned. After the first fruits wave offering had occurred, uh, there would be seven complete Sabbaths, counting from the Sabbath that followed the offering. When the priest was doing the offering, the next Sabbath began the count. And then they would count themselves to 50 days. We do count down, they were doing count up. They would be counting up to the 50th day. Um, and how long did the Pentecost event last? It would be one day and it would happen on the Jewish month now of Sivan and the number of the day of the month would be six, Sivan six. So because of the sun and the lunar calendar, it was always Sivan six. But if you were to look at our Julian calendar, you could see a list of the dates of that proper day in our terms and you'll see the dates are bouncing around all over because we're only using a solar calendar we're not using God's calendar when we use God's calendar it's bringing it in on a regular timing why is this important because he's going to do the timings on his dates not our dates not NASA's dates not anybody he's going to be doing it on God's dates on God's calendar that's what's important he's God so there was a priestly offering of two loaves of bread <clears throat> with very fine flour and uh, what was unusual is the priest would be waving these loaves and they were leavened. Leaven is a type, uh, when it's used in a spiritual sense, it's a type of sin. So normally you would expect in the, in the feast that they would have unleavened. You know when we have communion we have unleavened. When we break that pieces it's unleavened. But here, the priest is waving, and it's acceptable. He's offering God something with the pattern of sin, two loaves. And uh, what is suggested, and I believe it's a correct suggestion, is that the one loaf is representing Israel, and the second loaf is re representing the Gentiles, and both of them are in great sin, <laughs> all of them. And so it's representing the fact of sin coming together in the church. Know anybody in the church who is without sin? <laughs> and they're coming together for this church, this spirit empowerment and the formation of a church and it's going to be comprised of one loaf, Jews, second loaf, Gentiles, both loaves bringing sin. 
that Jesus is going to deal with. Jesus will deal with the sin by his blood. <clears throat> so, and of course, also to represent, by the way, a unity. We've got great division among certain people to the Jews, Jewish believers and so on, but to know they should be representing unity of the body. And to the Jew first. Romans 1, 16. So, the wave offering to the Jew of the time, he wasn't thinking what I've just said to you. What he's thinking is that he is thanking God for the dependence on God for the harvest and their daily bread. That, and uh, thanksgiving. Now, actually, of course, we should have a same mindset to bringing believers into the harvest, you know. And we should be thanking God that he is drawing people. Nobody can come to God without being drawn and without the Holy Spirit working, conviction of sin and other things. So God works and then we respond because we have eyes to see and ears to hear. But the process is initiated by God. And God gives us to Jesus. You notice the Son doesn't do the picking of it. The Father draws, the Holy Spirit convicts, and then whoever comes through that process in faith and belief on Jesus Christ under salvation is effectively then given as a bride, symbolically speaking, with the rest of the church to Jesus, his bride. Another one, Chinese, Zulu, English, even the English, <laughs> Afrikaans, and so on into the bride, Jewish, and so on. That's how it's working. <clears throat> it's only working for a time. We can't, I'm not going to go into it, but you know, there's a limit to this. There's a certain limit to this. It's not going on forever and ever and ever. <laughs> so t today, though, if you were to look at Jews that don't believe but are devout and are using their Hebrew scriptures, they, understandably, but sort of getting the emphasis a bit wrong they use the day of Pentecost to celebrate the fact that according to their research of the rabbis and that they believe that Sivan 6 was when Moses gave the Jews the written stone law the stone law on the mountain came down and gave it to the Jews and they sort of said whatever you say O oh Lord we will do and so on and he made a covenant with the Jews we, obviously when we understand what's going on with Jesus, we know that there is a new covenant. We're under a new covenant, right? And that's why we do the, the memorial through the communion, to remember the covenant. Remember he's coming. Remember what he did. Remember how we should be walking with him and remember the future. So we're remembering, not that the other event didn't occur, and not that it may have very well patterned on the same day, and it may have very well. Uh, but no, we're looking at the fulfillment we're not looking at the dress rehearsals and the patterns of the dress rehearsals. We're looking at where it was going to the reality of what it was all about. That's the, by the grace of God and by the spirit of God and by godly teachers, we begin to see things that unfortunately some of the uh, Jewish people are, by traditions and many other factors, are uh, resistant to hearing this in the general. Although there seems to be a move uh, shaking Israel in some of these things. So, you can see the issue, you can write it down if you wish and you're interested. You can see when this covenant of law was given, it was in Exodus 19, 1 to 11. And Exodus 19, 1 to 11. And you will see, as you're watching, the literal description of what was happening on the mountain and God coming down and Moses and everybody's getting scared and whatever. What are you, what are you seeing? You're seeing descriptions of things that are patterning what happened in Pentecost. One and a half thousand years later, what are you seeing? Wind, noise, fire, and a covenant. You're seeing these things happen. And when, you go to, when we go and look at Pentecost just now, a little bit of detail, we'll see that we're seeing a pattern, but now we're seeing the fulfillment, not the pattern, but the actual fulfillment of the things happening. And we're not seeing stone, we're seeing the law in the heart. We're not seeing a tablet anymore. We're now seeing where it was going to come into the heart. The tablet was intended to lead people to the need of a saviour, right? I can't do the law. I'm failing in the law. Anybody who thinks he's without sin is in delusion, if they understand what sin is today, of course. And so, yeah, so these things were happening. So, when did Jesus actually fulfil Pentecost? 
It was when he was glorified. Let's go to Acts 1. Acts 1. Let's switch, and, let's switch forward now to the actual realisation of Pentecost. The historical realisation of it. <clears throat> And uh, we see the first account, the uh, first one, um, we see Theophilus about everything Jesus began to do until the day he was taken up to heaven. Uh, this is when he went to be glorified. After he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles, he left orders with the apostles. To these he had presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom. So he was teaching them further about the kingdom of God before he left. He gathered them together. He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. And then he said, which you have heard from me. And there are other verses that repeat this thing he told them. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I can tell you exactly how many days it was. It was 10 days later on the 50th day. So he had 40 days of teaching, and there's significance to the number 40, but not for today. And uh, so then he left them, and 10 days later, on the Pentecost day, is when the event was going to occur of the Holy Spirit coming through. So Acts 2 then, just because we're going to jump, and he had ascended, let's go on. We're just touching a few things here, but if we go to Acts 2... When the day of Pentecost had come... As Jesus had asked, they were all together in one place in Jerusalem. There's some debate about whether it was a house or a, in the temple. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. Oh, that's like back in the uh, time at, uh, with the Jews uh, when they were coming out of Egypt and so on, yes. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves. And they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Right. So we're just going to stop there. I, you can read all about different effects. Realize that had this been the way the Bible was written, 50 days after Jesus dies there will be Pentecost. Um, he will send the Spirit. There will be no signs. You won't know it's happened. But trust me, I'm God, and uh, just trust me, you know, there was a Pentecost. Why, why have we got this? We haven't got this to go and teach everybody to try and speak in tongues. This tongues thing there is for a sign that the Jews of the day could recognize what was going on and that God is moving, and he's moving supernaturally. And we do see the, the actual apostles speaking in tongues that they didn't know. And because these Jews had come from dispersed areas, they, they had different background languages and they were hearing these things in their languages and they're going are these men drunk how do they know? what's going on and we see that this 120 people with the apostles in the core of this were speaking out and the glorifying God with other tongues in other words a tongue or a language that was not their own was not their native tongues that's what was going on and uh, so it was a sign and they knew this was a sign in front of us. There's thousands of Jews there. Thousands and thousands. And they're telling each other, these disciples have gone nuts. And they're talking, come listen. And uh, so they're drawing him into a maximum crowd for Peter to do his first sermon that we have recorded that follows in Acts 2. And it is the most wonderful sermon you could ever see. And you need to be asking yourself, how the heck could Peter deliver a sermon like that in front of thousands of people? And of course it was by the power, the power of the Holy Spirit come upon him. That's why, that's how. And uh, so yeah, the noise, the fire, filled with the Spirit, big sign. Of course the other people who are there seeing, seeing the visions of the fire and the wind, these are again audible visible they are shaken as well so they're witnesses they're witnesses to what has happened 120 ish people are in this room they've been praying and then suddenly boom it comes and they go and tell the people we could talk for a long while about that but i've got to move on so the evidence came in front of thousands of people and we saw that when peter gave his um speech his sermon 
uh, around 3,000 people were saved. And uh, when you go back to, uh, to the events that happened previous pattern in front of the mountain with the law, 3,000 died. Check your text and you'll see 3,000 people died under the law that gives death. And you come to the narrative in the New Testament and they're now talking about the grace and Christ and you see 3,000 live. Everything's being patterned for us. <clears throat> so Christ's fulfillment then at Passover, what has it achieved? What is it doing for us? You know, uh, yes, Jesus is the true Messiah. Yes, another thing, he must be alive. They said they saw him rise. They said they were talking with him. Now they said he sent this spirit. And they said he told them he was going to do it. And he's done it. And we can see the effects of this. See what this is doing to the Jews. I mean, it is, imagine how this is rocking their boat after one and a half thousand years of settling in on a cultural views with all their families and so on. And now they're asking them to completely unseat the way they've been looking at God and the way they've been looking at Jesus. Imagine it. Imagine what they had to do with ostracizing from their families, losing jobs, persecution and so on. They had to turn around. So this is a sign again of the evidence of the realities. Ah, oh, 3,000 Jews are so stupid, they would just do anything. You must be joking. Jews, they're some of the most skeptical people you can ever meet. <laughs> no. It's estimated by some historians that up to half the Jews in Jerusalem were saved, if not more. How? Because it's true. Because it's evidence. <clears throat> I mean, it didn't copy Judaism. What Jesus taught, it wasn't copying Jude. It was built upon it. So we are Judeo-Christian in a sense. We're Judea from the Judaic Mosaic era. We, we're carrying that forward. We're not dispensing with it. So we're Judeo-Christian, technically. But Christ wasn't giving a system of Judea. Why were they so angry? Well, he was, he was bringing new stuff in. But he didn't, I also didn't tell us everything the apostles said. Have you ever thought about that? He's in the bridge. So you can't accuse him of merely copying what went before, and you can't accuse the apostles of merely copying what went for, for both of the others. Events happened. Events happened that brought in the issue of the church and the spirit and the power and God moves with a Paul the Apostle and he gives him revelations and they're working together and we see Paul writing about a third or more, I don't know, maybe two thirds of the, of the New Testament. The guy who was killing all the Jews. <laughs> Incredible. So the Passover then, Romans 5.1 says, having been justified by faith, this is a believer now, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Jesus wants our peace, if, uh, for the record, if you were to go to John 20, pe uh, Jesus talking three times, peace be upon you, peace be upon you, peace be upon you. And peace, look up the word peace, have a look what that, the fullness of that means, you know, tranquility, uh, rest and so on. Look up the fullness of that word in the Greek, what it means. But how? How are we going to do it? Well, it's by Jesus. But how is it us when we accept, okay, Pentecost, Jesus, Holy Spirit, it's all right, he did rise from the dead, I believe. How do I get the peace? Because it said you've got peace, it didn't say you have peace. Do you understand? You can go, well, I know I've got peace with God, and yet you're taking antidepressants. What's the difference between the knowledge of it and the receiving and this today is the important thing coming now is that we got to, to we want the peace but we got to set our side uh, we got to set ourselves aside from the world and worldly ways this is what we've got to do we've got to give ourselves to Jesus there's no other way we've got to give ourselves completely and wholeheartedly to Jesus if we want this peace to experience it we've got it we've got peace with God but do we want to know this peace? Or do we just want to know about the peace? So we will not only have peace with God if we 
move from the world and move to Jesus, we will know peace with God. Now that's Passover, fine. So Passover, one of the big fees. Let's now go to Pentecost. What about Pentecost? You see, not only was it telling us events, proving Jesus and so on, it was doing another thing. It was telling us how we get power to do what Jesus wants us to do. We watch and we, well, they didn't have power, then suddenly they all have power. Why? The Holy Spirit. So it's leading us, it's showing us things here. And God wants us to know his power. He wants to know that we have access to this power. And Jesus taught that if you're a believer, you will have, every believer will have the Holy Spirit indwelling, but not necessarily, again, experiencing the power. It depends on our relationship. And uh, John 14, in there we see verse 16. Jesus says, I'll ask the Father, he'll give you another helper, the Holy Spirit, that he may be with you forever. And uh, verse 17, the second half of that. You know him because he abides with you and will be in you. So God sends his Holy Spirit to indwell all of us. And uh, how, how do we even get into the church? 1 Corinthians 12, 13 tells us that. Because we may think there are preferable, there are sort of superior Christians that know and they're connected with the Spirit, but I'm not. No, no. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 tells us, for by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. So we all have the Holy Spirit within us. It's no use going, I, I can't do it. No, sure you can't. But the Holy Spirit can. <laughs> We just got to face reality. The Holy Spirit can. Admit we can't. Great. First step. Step two, God's got to make a plan. Great. I'm going to have to rely on Jesus. I'm going to have to rely on the power of the Spirit sent by Jesus for me, for my success. Will he do it? If I was to pray, oh Lord Jesus, and I pray it now, oh Lord Jesus, may we know your Spirit in greater measure, Lord, uh, help us, we pray, to walk holy, that we don't do things that, that prevent us experiencing the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that we would know it in greater measure, that we could walk closer with you, that we would know you, we would know your peace, and we would do what you require us to do with that power, that power that you make available to us. Not just to conquer sin, but to obey you and follow your commands. I ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Now, if we pray those things, uh, are we praying something that uh, is in the will of God and will of Jesus? Yes. <laughs> so the church was started in power. He sent the Holy Spirit to empower and prepare the bride, the church. We're the bride. He's the groom. He's gone away. He's going to come back. He's going to want to be ready to collect his bride, his pure bride. So if we use prayer because what were they doing in the upper room as a just as a pattern of connecting with everything's there for a reason it's not just there for an event that's got no connection to us prayer continuous prayer prayer eager seeking prayer prayer what do we see jesus saying <laughs> matthew 7 7 to 11 ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and it will be opened to you for everyone who asks receives he who finds and to him who knocks it will be opened what man is there among you when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he won't give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Is it good to have the Holy Spirit and to have the power and to walk stronger, stronger to the glory of God? Not because we want to be the man of the hour or anything like that. I don't mean that at all. But to be closer. To be able to do, show more love. Understand the depths of the scriptures. But we've got to be receiving. God's not going to coerce us. He's not going to force us to do this. He'll draw. He'll draw. He'll woo. But we have the power to say, I'm busy. I'm watching cricket. I need to watch that. I might maybe get round to something later on or whatever, etc. You know, I'm just giving an example. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Acts 1.14. Were they praying? These with all one mind at Pentecost were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Prior to what? 
prior, prior to the encounter of the Holy Spirit. As you will, if you pray, do you force the Holy Spirit to do this? No, as he wills. <laughs> he is God. And uh, we may pray and we see nothing. Day one, keep praying. Day two, keep praying. Show that you want it. Show that you need it. Show that you're eager. And he will answer. This I can say, knowing God, knowing the promises of his word, if we want to know the power of the Spirit more in our lives, we've got to seek and ask earnestly, privately, each of us. <clears throat> and uh, so we see the example in Pentecost. The power for what? The power to love and obey Jesus, the power for ministry, particularly ministry to, what did he ask in the Great Commission? To make disciples. Nearly finished. So the fruit of receiving the power, the infilling that we would get, the empowerment that can come, will lead to devotion to what? Acts 2.42, because we look, we go and look at what happened to the church when they called, the Spirit came, fell on them with power. What was the fruit? Acts 2.42. It led to devotion to apostolic teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. And that is why Salvi is spending so much time here, drilling us and drilling us with what we should be about. Other things in life have got to carry on, yes, but the core of our spiritual walk should be centering around these things. Um, and uh, Salvi's been opening that up for us, uh, praise God. <clears throat> so my final summary then. God has told us from the beginning through the seven feasts what major events will accompany Jesus' redemption actions in all world history. Four have happened, three remain. The events are on a calendar, God's calendar, not the world's satanic calendar. We should know and get to know these feasts. He gave them for all believers, not the Jews. He gave them for all believers, not just the Jews. So we should get to know them. And we should be prepared to gently and lovingly defend the fact that it's God's calendar and every believer should be aware of what God is planning and what he said he'll do in his word. And then they can argue with God, not us. <clears throat> At Passover, Jesus has made a way of eternal salvation, the way of peace, enabling us to have peace with God. And uh, for those who, for those sinners who will trust him for forgiveness of sin and the free gift of eternal life, he's made a way for us to have and to know God's peace. By who? Jesus. By who? Jesus. At Pentecost, he sent the Spirit, his Spirit, to give holy power to the bride. Why? To prepare herself before she meets Jesus one day by loving Jesus and receiving the Spirit power through submission, service, and prayer. It's simple. It's actually quite simple what's going on. God loves us. He doesn't wish that any man perish. Some people find this hard to believe. He does not wish that any man perish. I just, uh, if you close your eyes, I'll just close in a prayer. Lord, help us to give our hearts to you in fuller measure to Jesus, to your Son. Let us not forget our first love. Let us love him again. Let us commit ourselves to loving him, O Lord, above all else in the world. Let us cast aside the idols of our life and come holy to Jesus holy and holy and let us call upon his name in faith on and on and on let us persevere that we may receive the fullness of salvation in the power of the spirit and lord pentecost was about thanksgiving i thank you for sending your spirit i thank you jesus for your redemptive acts that you've done and will do i thank you lord thank you from the bottom of my heart thank you jesus thank you lord thank you father Amen and Amen.